Attend AutoCon 2 in Denver, November 20th through 22nd, 2024. You'll hear presentations about network automation from hands-on engineers who built automation systems for their company and have the scars to prove it. Conference pricing is not high, but this is a boutique event with limited tickets. Go to networkautomation.forum slash AutoCon 2 to register today. Welcome to Packet Butcher's Heavy Networking. I'm Ethan Banks with Drew Conray Murray. If you've ever advertised the IP of a GRE tunnel endpoint through the tunnel itself, causing the tunnel to collapse, you found your tribe. Drew and I are on LinkedIn in the Packet Pushers Community Slack group. If you'd like to chat with us, connect with us on LinkedIn and join our Slack at packetpushers.net slash community. On today's episode, OSPF filtering, that is how to filter routes from a device's routing table in an OSPF environment. This is a tricky business because OSPF requires an identical database on every device in an OSPF area. That means you can't stop announcing a route from one OSPF router because you don't want that route to show up on that router or in a downstream routers. OSPF routers go through a database synchronization process to ensure that they are identical so that when they run their shortest path first algorithm they all come up with the same answers the same paths through the ospf area different ospf databases would cause ospf routing chaos and yet and yet there are times where you don't want a route to show up in a specific ospf router or want to filter a route from an entire ospf area is this possible are there stupid router tricks you can perform that might help you filter a route despite ospf's inherent nature to help us answer these questions today is Mason Reimert. Mason is a network engineer and CCIE candidate who did a recent write-up on OSPF filtering on his tech blog, MasonReimert.com. Mason, welcome to Heavy Networking. And uh, man, we got to start by uh, by telling the people a bit about your induction into networking, how, how you got started, because I think your story is pretty unusual and it's a, it's a great way for the audience to get to know you. Yeah, so I, I started in networking when I was really young. Um, I was 16. I was going to Votech for networking. It was a specific networking program. And I signed up to do an internship with my high school. And shortly before my internship started, the person who was our network administrator had had resigned. So there was a long time where we didn't have a network administrator. And I sort of knew the most networking out of our group of people. And day to day, I sort of got a little bit more responsibility as as I went on in my high school career. And by the time I graduated high school, um, they had actually offered me a full-time job there, and I moved into a network administration position right after high school. I stayed there for a little bit, and now I work at a financial institution doing networking all day. <laughs> you got started in high school. I just love that. Uh, our network guy resigned. Mason, what do you think? You up, to, <laughs> you up for it, buddy? Yep. <laughs> Well, now, I mean, you're you're still pretty pretty young, and you are you're, you're working on your CCIE. What uh, what CCIE track are you working on? I'm working on enterprise. I I touch a lot of um, stuff that's not just routing and switching, so like ICE and central management stuff, and Meraki and Umbrella. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of routing and switching day to day, but I also do a lot of like VPNs and overlays and stuff like that. Okay. And I guess uh, that would take us to uh, OSPF. That certainly that's going to be a big part of your studies. Has been a big part of your studies. And you wrote a blog post that uh, was very very tight with a diagram that showed you these are the places that you can do OSPF filtering, and these are the different methods that you could use at the CLI if you wanted to do that filtering. Um, I take it that was part of your CCIE studies. Yeah, yeah. So I myself was was constantly going back to my own notes, which was. Where where can you actually filter? Because the tricky part isn't the filtering. The commands are actually pretty simple. It's more, it'll take that command on any router in your topology. But whether it actually performs the action you desire is is completely dependent on where you put that command, what router you put that command on. Uh, so then I, I think we need to, uh, to, to to start from the beginning and uh, and, and talk a bit about a bit about OSPF. Um, I mentioned some of it in the intro, but I, I think the right place to start then is explaining to folks what we need to understand about OSPF to uh, to be able to filter successfully. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing to understand is the differences between OSPF and a different routing protocol like EIGRP. So with with OSPF, you're it's a it's a synchronized database. It's a distributed database across all the routers in an area. So every router has an identical copy of the same information and then they draw a graph with themselves at the center. So 
comparing it to other routing protocols where they're routing based on information from their neighbor that's reported by their neighbor, sort of like street signs. These routers are actually drawing a map with themselves in the center of the map. And that map is all inclusive on every router and it needs to be completely inclusive on all of the routers that are in an area. Now, there was a key word you said there, Mason, uh, routers in an area. Um, I, I, there's going to be a lot of people that understand OSPF fundamentals and OSPF areas. But for those that don't, since areas is such a crucial part of this discussion, would you explain an OSPF area? Yeah, so an area is a way to to segment an OSPF topology. So a topology that would still be under the same administrative domain, but you want that domain to be separate and you want the database synchronization to be confined to that those specific groups of routers. So when it was introduced, it was a way to cut down routing table sizes and SPF sizes. Um, Now it's more an organizational thing. Um, Every area, every numbered area must must connect back to area zero. So area zero is the backbone area. Um, So when you do your segmentation, all your all your areas, so if you have like area one and area two, they connect back to area zero and then they exchange information across area zero. So the identical nuances here happen within the area and the, the places you can filter are those routers that sit between areas. Yes. So those routers are, they have special names. They're, they're area border routers, ABRs, area border routers. They sit in between area zero and, and some other area. So if we think about that, our, our area topology in OSPF, like a hub and spoke where area zero is the hub and every other area hangs off of it as a spoke and ABR would have an interface in both areas, in area zero and in the other area, uh, whatever that is, to uh, to form the beginning of that spoke. And then you can you can branch out from there. Uh, another point, Mason, historically, uh, you're talking about why we would have areas. Well, back in the day, right, it was to control the number of computations that were happening on routers back when control plane CPU was very precious and you didn't if you had a lot of routers with a lot of links, a lot of circuits in there, it could really tax an OSPF router's control plane CPU. So you would make administrative areas so that, well, we're going to bound the size of our SPF and the number of calculations that we might have to do. And and a rule of thumb was roughly 50 routers in an area way back in the day. And now control plane CPUs have all kinds of power. And so unless you have a a very good reason to separate your OSPF environment into multiple areas. You, you probably don't. And in fact, I've interviewed guys who uh, work for service providers. And they got, yeah, we got, got a thousand routers in the OSPF area with many more circuits than that. And there's churn all the time and it's fine. They're basically SPS calculating very regularly and it's not a problem. Uh, but now we might organizationally want to split up into areas, some of which might have to do with filtering actually Mason. Yeah, and, and that's a common theme of, of using these features that were meant for one thing for another thing, um, especially in regards to filtering. And another misconception that people have going on the area thing is it's not like BGP were the routers in an autonomous system. With OSPF, the interface is in an area. Yeah. So when when you don't have two routers to connect an area, you have one router that has an interface in each area. That's what makes an area border router and area border router. So one question I have is, sounds like the databases uh, being synchronized are very important. I presume there are mechanisms in the protocols to make sure that uh, they are synchronized and that uh, a change happens, that there's also a pause on any other changes to make sure that synchronization happens. Yeah. So essentially when two routers become OSPF neighbors, um, they describe their databases to each other. So they send a series of messages that, that describe uh, basically a table of contents of the entries of their database. Then the router that receives that table of contents will send request messages for just the parts they don't have. And that continues until every router in the area has that full, complete description of that database. Yeah, the synchronization process has, has got to happen. Um, it's And proving the routers have to understand and know that they truly do have the latest copy of the database. There's all kinds of scenarios where you know a new router could be joining. It could have been power cycled. It could have lost connectivity, and it's rejoining the area after it had been isolated. And so, yeah, there are those mechanisms in place to uh, prove that, okay, I do truly have the latest copy of the database, and everybody's got the latest copy of what I have to share. And, uh, and now the databases are synchronized, so it's safe for me to go ahead and perform my SPF calculation. No, I'm going to get the same answer everybody else is getting, only as Mace is saying, with themselves in the middle, that router in the middle. 
mm-hmm. of uh, of the graph. So, Mason, before we get into filtering, then I think um, we should talk about when filtering is maybe a bad idea because uh, there's lots of reasons that we we want. As engineers, we tend to nerd out on like we can do this, but whether or not we should do this or have a good reason to do this is is a different topic. But I, I like to think about the why of things. So maybe we should start out with uh, when, when do you think filtering's a, a bad idea? I think filtering's a bad idea when, first of all, when you want different places in the network to have different policy enacted on them and you're using reachability to determine policy. So I think that's a mistake in itself. Um, policy and reachability should be separate. So if if your intention is to enact a security policy, you should look at a different solution right away. Um, that's really not what routing protocols are meant to do, and especially a routing protocol like OSPF where synchronization is essential to its function. There are some places where filtering is easy and it's not detrimental to the database. And those are on those area border routers. There's also another concept called an autonomous system boundary router or ASBR. ASBRs pull in external routing information into into an area or an OSPF domain. So basically a redistribution of routes from one protocol or connected routes into OSPF. Those so could be ju- like, or a BGP router could be yes. sitting there on the edge, and yeah, and, yeah. and you want to you would redistribute some of those routes learned via BGP into the OSPF area, yeah, yeah. OSPR. And, and those routes that that you pull in from another protocol, those are subject to a different set of rules than the routes that are originated into OSPF via local network statements. So if you're redistributing routes in from BGP, there are actually different places you can filter those routes than a route that you originated within the OSPF domain. So a method you use to filter in one area or in one instance may not work in another instance because the route type is different. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I was thinking about this before um, before we started recording and and you know, when is it a bad idea to filter? And and my first point with echoes yours exactly. It's like, could I have fixed this with a firewall policy? Is a, a, another point of that is so many times with security stuff, we're being audited. Well, if you're filtering with a firewall policy, uh, that's going to show up in an audit. Look, here in the policy is where I'm doing this, as opposed to, yeah, I'm filtering that route off so it doesn't appear in the network. But if someone managed to, you know, make it, it's just it's just not clean. It's uh, much nicer if you're doing it with the firewall policy. Yeah. Uh, a, another thought I had is, could you? Could you take the thing that you're you're trying to filter, a subnet or a specific device, and connect it to the network in a different way or somewhere else to, to make the problem easier to solve? Maybe it shouldn't be connected to that OSPF router. Maybe you need to hang it off of the network in a different area. Or I don't mean OSPF area. I mean a different yeah. place entirely <laughs> that would make it easier to solve the problem, perhaps. Um Yet another thing is a lot of times, this this is a pet peeve of mine, has been for years. A lot of things we as network engineers get asked to solve problems that should be getting solved by someone higher up the stack. Why should I have to hide a device or a subnet using route filtering and OSPF when the answer is you need to set up proper authentication and authorization on the device so that when people knock on its door, they're, they're not allowed admission. You know, you, you just, you're too lazy to set the thing up. Right. So you know, you're asking me to fix your problem. You to go fix your own problem. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's, there's solutions like in the enterprise space, there's newer ways to do that, like security group tags and stuff that sort of abstract that from IP a little bit. And then on the sort of SaaS side or provider side, I always say that, the problem is developers don't trust their own code. And then they rely on us <laughs> to, to secure it because they don't want even the front door of their app exposed to the internet. So there's a plethora of different ways that are better than pulling the routes out of tables to secure things. You know, another reason I've run into where you might want to filter some routes out is duplicate IP addressing. Um, that's can be like, oh, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just hide this one. Yeah, but could you NAT it though? I mean, isn't there a NAT that you yeah. could drop in somewhere that would fix this issue? And sometimes there is an OSPF solution to that that's not filtering. You can actually, and I've done this in in some instances where you have two provider handoffs coming down. I run them in separate OSPF processes, hmm. so they're two separate databases. So even if you need to do handoffs to two things that are running OSPF, you don't necessarily need to mesh those databases together. You can run them into separate processes. And then if you want reachability between the two, you can redistribute. And it's easier to change that information when you're going between different processes sometimes. 
And I suppose you could you know, take that on steroids and do different VRFs as opposed to just simply different processes. Yeah, yeah, you could do that too. Yep. And then the last thought that I had as I was thinking through this thing, uh, would an access list solve the problem? I mean, it's more intuitive to troubleshoot that. And, and the thing about hiding routes in OSPF is it isn't, if you're not looking for it, you're not expecting that as, as a network engineer to be the thing that's happening, then it's, uh, it can be a little obscure to figure out what's going on. An access list is just, it's more straightforward. It's more in your face. You can you can log on access list so that if someone's trying to hit that, um, that's a log that would show up somewhere in a syslog that you could find. Uh, not that that would be my my first choice, but um, but yet another option that I would consider before actually doing OSPF route filtering. Yeah, d- definitely. I think one of the things that people need to keep in mind is stateful versus stateless. Um, and some people will filter with access lists, and they they won't understand that an access list is is one way. It's you're not opening a door like you are with a firewall. Which is why I always say, you know, if if you are looking to secure something that should be in and out of a firewall, um, or you have to maintain both sides of that flow, you know, for every firewall rule, it's two ACEs, two access control entries, because you have the the path there and the path back. One thing I'm gleaning from this conversation that it sounds like if I am going to uh, filter routes that I need to really document this well so that somebody else coming on the scene has a clue as to what's going on. I see nodding. Oh, baby. Yeah, it's, uh, it's both of us nodding. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's just one of those. It's, it's, it's such an, uh, it's a more obscure thing. You're going to see it in your router OSPF paragraph. It's just, it's, it, it's, it's not the thing you lead with. It's not a, it's not a, a router configuration technique that you, you like, oh, everybody filters routes to solve these sorts of problems. That's just the way you do it. No, it isn't. It's like it's a tool in the toolbox, but it's a tool you don't reach for very often. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of back there in the corner. It might have a little rust on it. And uh, you, you got to pull it out like, <laughs> well, I'm glad I got this tool because it's going to help me solve the problem. But I, I'd rather use one of my other tools most of the time. Yeah, and, and sometimes you'll see configuration. And like I said, depending on where it's applied, it might be doing nothing. I have ran across networks that other people have built that, you know, it was something they tried. And that config is still on the box and they didn't take it off because it didn't do anything. <laughs> but then you also think it's doing something if you don't understand how OSPF works completely. And, and then you think yeah. you're like, oh, I found where they filtered this, but that's not actually where they filtered it. Yeah. yeah some leftover, because as you were saying in the opening, uh, Mason, you can put the code in, it'll take it. But if it's not on an ABR and ASBR where you can actually do some of this filtering, then that code that would work as expected on an ABR, ASBR doesn't do anything it's but it but it but it doesn't throw an error it's just you know yep. accomplishing nothing for you now in your blog post mason you described some false filtering techniques that we want to avoid so i, I think maybe we were just talking about one of them but uh, but let's get into that yeah i think the the first thing the thing people use the most are distribute lists a lot of times uh people look at route filtering and they think distribute lists and the distribute list c- command is there under the ospf process the problem is what it does is not similar to other routing protocols. So if you're thinking EIGRP and distribute list, this is completely different. Um, what an OSPF distribute list does is essentially inserts a shim between the OSPF process and the routing table on the device. So you're not so between built, the rib and the fib. Not in between, between the rib and the OSPF fib, but routing in, process in the and the OSPF rib. process and the rib. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So as I learn routes in, so an inbound distribute list. As I learn routes in. No matter what my distribute list says, the OSPF process is still going to run through those routes and it's still going to advertise them to neighbors. It's just not going to install them in my routing table. So this is going back yeah. to the database must be synchronized. The database has no concept of a route. So you can't filter a route in the database because at that point they're not routes yet. So no matter what you do with the distribute list, you're going to, in most cases, except one of the false techniques we'll talk about. Um, you're going to advertise them to your neighbors, no matter what a distribute list says, just like an outbound <laughs> distribute list. So, okay, so this is this is important because w- what we're getting back to is that database synchronization process. The OSPF process is sitting by itself and doing its thing. It's going to come up with calculations, feed that into the rib, the routing information base that's on the router, along with whatever other routing processes might be running on that router. And then the router from there sorts out, based on all the entries in the rib, what needs to actually go into the FIB, the forwarding information base. The thing when you say show IP route, it shows you actually what forwarding is going to be happening. 
So it, it, back to your point, Mason, the distribute list is filtering in between the OSPF process uh, that's still doing database synchronization, talking to neighbors and doing things with, uh, with uh, hello timers and dead timers and all that stuff, uh, and actually completing calculations and handing them up to the RIB. Distribute list says, okay, OSPF, you calculated this. Oh, there's, there's one of those routes you calculated. I'm not passing that along to the RIB because the distribute list is filtering that route out, correct? Yes. Yep. But neighboring routers are still going to see those because of database synchronization and all of that good stuff. So you're going to filter it from the one router. Uh, it's not going to show up in the in in the forwarding information base. Ultimately, you should do show IP route. It won't be there, but it'll be on every other router in the area. Yes, it will. And and depending on where you put that distribute list, you may actually accomplish breaking reachability. So if your goal was you don't want reachability between two things and you're only testing by pings and you put one of those distribute lists in there, your neighbors will still get the route, which is what you think you're, you're accomplishing is your neighbor's not getting the route. Your neighbors are going to get the route, but your ping might stop working because you filtered it from one of the routing tables along the data path of the packet. So you're not really filtering the route. You're dropping the packet on the router that you put the distribute list on, which also means if there's multiple paths, you might get the, into this thing where you have 50% of the traffic succeeding depending on your load balancing. Or you could be actually causing a routing loop because it could show up, uh, the route's not in the routing table, and if you're running a default, it could head out the default. Or if it you've got a... Yeah, maybe maybe a you know, larger network it could fall under that, and then you know just just loop out because the the OSPF router with that route thinks, oh, I get to it via you know this router, router F that we did the filtering on, shows up at router F where the filter is, and is like, I don't know how to get there, and and right, yep. drops yep. it, loops it, sends it across the DCMP path, so it's confusing. Yeah, so okay, so so we're talking about these false. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I always say that the one place you can use a distribute list is on a router that's doing redistribution because that's where it will work. That was its basically intent is if you're redistributing routes in from, say, BGP and you're pulling them into OSPF and you put a distribute list on that router, that will actually prevent those routes from propagating. But if you're using a distribute list on any other router in the topology other than an ASBR for routes that it originates, you're playing that game of, you know, you may you may degrade the routing table, but you're not going to filter it like you wanted to. A quick interruption to tell you about Autocon 2, the third in the Autocon conference series about network automation. Only don't think of Autocon as a typical conference. Instead, Autocon is a gathering of the networking industry to work towards a standardized approach to network automation. And this is a this is a hard problem. Equipment vendors have a vested interest in selling you their automation tools, but let me guess, you're a multi-vendor shop. There are so many open source tools you could bring into your automation stack that it can be overwhelming. And if you want to integrate with products like ServiceNow, that is an added complexity. If you've tried moving from simple Python scripts to a robust automation system the business can rely on, you, you know what I'm getting at. And this this is why the Network Automation Forum exists, why the Autocon Conference Series exists, and why you should attend Autocon 2 in real time in Denver, November 20th through 22nd, 2024. Hear the talks, interact with the speakers, talk to other attendees in the hallway track, meet the people making automation tools, talk to vendor experts who live and breathe this stuff. You're going to leave with solid ideas about how to approach network automation for your company. Ideas that will impact the business that you support in a very positive way. Register at networkautomation.forum slash autocon2. And I don't, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but don't wait because this event is almost certainly going to sell out and the venue only holds so many humans. There really is a ticket cap. Again, that's networkautomation.forum slash autocon2. And I hope to see you in Denver. And now, back to the podcast. What other false filtering techniques have we got to talk about? So there's, there's a filtering technique um, that uses static routes, actually. So if you put a static route on an ABR, and that ABR was supposed to move a route between areas, that same route that you entered as a static, it won't move that route. So I know some people that have filtered like this, they'll go on their, their area border router that sits between their area and area zero, and they'll type in an IP route for the route they don't want sent via OSPF. 
And the reason that that works is because basically OSPF checks the routing table uh, to make sure there's an OSPF route for the route it's translating into the other area. And if that route's not an OSPF route, it doesn't do the translation. The tricky thing with that and the reason I call it a false technique is because it's completely platform dependent. That will work on Cisco. That will not work on a lot of other vendors. Now, are you talking about the IP route like you're doing an IP route to null zero or something where the intent is to drop it or something else? It could be anything. It could even be a valid IP route. The problem isn't that, that the route is valid or not. The problem is that the route exists. So because the, the AD of a static route is so low, when you enter a static route for an OSPF prefix, it's always going to take precedence over the OSPF prefix. So then when the AD, OSPF... if you're listening as in as an administrative distance, where if the route, if if a route is known to a router by multiple protocols, administrative distance sorts out which of those routes gets preference. Static routes and connected routes are are, are very, very a very, very low number. So they always have a you know very high presence. They're the ones that are going to be chosen. So a static route is going to be chosen over OSPF, which has an administrative distance of 110, I think. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. That hasn't changed over the decades. Great. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and and therefore, your static route is going to trump the OSPF route on that local router anyway, but OSPF still has decisions to make, which, which yes. is where I interrupted you, Mason. Yeah. And, and that usually wouldn't matter. If that route was on an, an intermediate router that wasn't an area border router going between two areas, it wouldn't do anything because it would, like we said before, you can't filter there. Uh, the database yeah. is going to be identical. So no matter what you do to your local rib, you might impact reachability in the data plane, but you're never going to impact that route being advertised to neighbors. Um, but doing that on an area border router, that is where that LSA, that um, I shouldn't say LSA, that is where that route is being moved from one area to another. So if you have a static route in your routing table that's overtaking that OSPF route, it fails a check and it won't move it. Hmm. But again, you said it's platform dependent. It is. So to prove that, I tested this in, in a Linux routing suite, and it does not check the routing table. It just moves the route. Um, but Cisco it does check the, the route. It moves the route as in behaves the way OSPF w- yeah, would yeah. behave. So, as you, so if you you're sending it, it from, yeah. a, from another area to area zero, no matter what static routes are on the box, it's going to move to area zero. But that's yeah. not true on Cisco. Okay, so the takeaway is if you think this is a filtering technique, it's platform dependent. It it may work on Cisco, but if you've got another platform, you could be causing yourself some problems. Yeah, especially if you've a lot of places where this filtering technique were used are in older networks. So if they're on older Cisco boxes and you replace them with non Cisco boxes and you try to do the same thing, you're not going to be able to achieve it. All right. What other false filtering techniques, Mason, if any? There's a concept called forwarding address, and it's basically the next hop of an external route. Um, So if you redistribute into OSPF from another protocol, so if you take a BGP route and pull it into OSPF, there's a field called forward address. And oversimplification, but it's, it's the next hop of the route. There's some stuff people do to filter that next hop. When you filter the next hop, the route doesn't resolve. When the route doesn't resolve, it doesn't get installed in the rib. So essentially what people do is on the area border router, they filter that next hop reachability. Then the route that is relying on that next hop gets filtered as well. That's just really confusing and you sort of have to recurse it in your mind to understand why it's getting filtered. That's probably the most complex one, but I'm mentioning it because mostly that happens by accident. People are like, people are like, I don't need this network over here. And they're not looking at their their tables, their OSPF database, so they don't understand there's dependencies on it. So they filter it, and then a bunch of other routes get yanked from the table, and they don't understand why. But OSPF does that automatically. There's a, there's a few criteria you have to meet for that field to be filled out, that next top forwarding address field. But if that field is filled out, it must be reachable for that OSPF route to be valid. It's making a comparison to BGP. BGP relies on reachability of the next hop in order for that route to be installed, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. So BGP, the route will be invalid if the if the next hop isn't reachable. And that's sort of what happens here. Although I'll give it to BGP, it's a lot more visible because people are yeah. used to doing show IP BGP and, you know, the symbol's missing. The symbol for valid's missing. 
OSPF isn't that easy. It just won't be in the rib and you'll have to basically show the database. And then I think there's a little inaccessible flag next to the next hop. Did we get all the false filtering ones you wanted to bring up, Mason, or are there some more? Yeah, no, th- those are those are the false filtering ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we talked false then. What are some filtering what's some filtering that we can do? And I are we tying this to the Cisco platform in particular? So the filtering you can do is platform agnostic. Okay. Um because you're doing it the right way, you know, everybody that conforms to the standard is going to be able to do these filtering techniques. Okay. Great. The the overarching rule that I tell people to remember is valid filtering can only occur when the route is originated or translated. And by translated, I mean move between an area. So if you're filtering it anywhere other than that, it's invalid. But if you want so, to... So define origination and translation then, just yeah, to make it very so, clear to people. So origination is where you're introducing the route into the OSPF process or the OSPF domain. So if I use a network statement to put a route into the OSPF domain or I redistribute routes in from another protocol like BGP, I'm originating that route. The translation piece is... If I'm sitting on the border of an area in area zero, and I have an interface in two areas, and I'm moving routes between those two areas, I'm sending routes from one area to another. Okay, so we got origination and translation, and that is the key. Where I am originating a route, announcing it into the OSPF area uh, as the router that is telling the OSPF world, hey, here's a route I know about, uh, as you said, with a network statement. Uh, or lighting up OSPF on the interface, um, you know, di- different different techniques to do it, um, or translating um, from that external process to OSPF. These are the places that I can I can filter. Yeah, and there are some different ways to filter based on the route type. So if the route was redistributed in from another protocol, it's a different type of route, like we said, from from a route that was pulled directly into OSPF um, with a network statement. So there's a there's a summary address command, which was meant for summarization, but there's a flag on it you can set not advertise. So you're essentially making a summary to catch the routes you want to catch and then telling the router not to advertise them. That's totally valid on a an ASBR, a boundary router, which is the router that's doing the redistribution in. So say from like BGP into OSPF, you can use a summary address with the not advertise command there. That's a valid method of summarization for an external route that's redistributed into the domain. So the uh, the area range command again, which allows me to aggregate routes uh, and, and announce a summary, a summarization. I could use that technique at, by if let's see, there's a slash twenty four I wanted to to filter off. I could build a summary route that is equal to that slash twenty four. So technically, I'm not really summarizing anything. Yes. It happens to be a match. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I could use that with the no with the not advertise keyword at the end, so that that route doesn't make it across the ABR and, and into the other areas. Yeah, and essentially both filtering the both types of routes use the same not advertise keyword. So whether you're filtering um, when it's getting translated from one area to another on an area border router, you use area range, not advertise, and if you're filtering external route, you use summary address, not advertise. But like you said, it's not really a summary. It can be a summary. You can catch multiple if you want to, if you want to suppress or filter multiple, but you don't need to. It can be the exact route you're trying to filter. So that, okay. So we've got uh, that, that straightforward technique. Again, those are only going to work on ABRs or ASBRs. Uh, give, Give me another thing that I can do. What you can do is if you have a, a route that's redistributed in, so it's coming in from another protocol, it's an external route, and you don't want to do the filtering on the router that is originating that route, so the originating router, you can essentially force a translation. So you're not breaking the rules of translation or, or the originating router. But mm-hmm. you use the, a feature called stub, which a lot of people know about stub. It's it, once again, one of those features that wasn't meant to be used for this. It was meant to be used to, <laughs> to compress sizes and not import routes. Um, but people use it for summarization now. So if you make your area a stub, you can then filter when the routes are translated out of the sub 
which you wouldn't normally be able to do with an external route. You can only usually filter an external route on the router that originates it because an external route is different than an internal route. It doesn't get translated along the path. The, the external route is the only route in OSPF that stays consistent as it flows across multiple areas. So usually your only chance to filter it is on the router that's originating it, unless that area is turned into a stub area, where then you can filter it where it's translated out of the stub area. So so, so we're sort of abusing stub areas a little bit here, kind, kind of. Um, but for people that are, you know, they've studied OSPF, and but maybe the different OSPF area types are vague in their mind. Review for us what a stubby, uh, a stub area is. Yeah, so a stub area is basically an area that doesn't import any external routes in it. So it, any routes that are redistributed into another area won't show up in this area. It essentially only lets internal OSPF routes flow into it. Usually this is supplemented with something like a default route. So mm -hmm. you maintain reachability, but your tables were much smaller. Yeah. So it was a method of table compression without uh, sacrificing reachability. Um, there are a few variations of stub, um, but that was the goal of all of them. Yeah. yeah stubby and, uh, and not so stubby NSSA yes. areas is, and I forgot the distinction. It's a subtle distinction between the yeah, two. So, so not so stubby is? is actually the, the one that we we would be sort of abusing in this case, because not so stubby allows you to originate external routes, but not receive them. Right. So <laughs> In order to do that, they invented a new route type, and that's why we can filter it, because it needs to be translated at the ABR from that route type to a normal external route. And because translation is occurring, we can filter it. That's a the 7 reason, to a 5. Is that right? Yes. Yep. And SSA external is a 7, and normal external is a 5. The reason I classify this as a valid method of filtering is because it will work on every platform. Hmm. It will work on every plat. It will work reliably on every platform that conforms to OSPF. Well, so, what are you implying there? That just because you can doesn't mean you should. It'll work. I mean, but, uh, yeah, but, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. implying that for someone who hasn't studied OSPF explicitly, this would be really hard to understand why. It would be really hard for them to to look at a network and understand why is this a stub in 2024. You know, there, there's no reason we need to compress <laughs> our table sizes anymore. I'm going to make this. Right. I'm going to make this not a stub anymore. And then you'll have routes propagating that weren't propagating if that was a stub because of filtering. It's so funny to talk about stub areas and summarization and things like that. Cause 20 years ago, I was, I worked with some pretty sizable OSPF networks. And one of the goals was when partitioning off uh, this campus into an area, let's say was how small can I make the routing table and still have everything work right. It was a game, you know, it was like a big deal. You could probably, Oh, I got it down to 10 routes. Oh, you know, thump my mighty chest because uh, I, I did all the manipulation to get it working that way and, it, and make it nice and clean. And as you said, now it's like, why in 2024 would we do that? It doesn't matter. Why am I obfuscating details? I want I want all the details and there's no penalty for doing so. Yeah. All right, Mason, give us uh, give us some more techniques. So there there's a method to, like I said, use a distribute list on a router that is advertising external routes. So along with redistribution, that's because that's origination, you can filter there. You can also summarize there. So pretty much everywhere you're pulling routes into the OSPF domain and everywhere you're changing routes is okay to do. What It's just the where. So an valid method of filtering could be completely invalid if you put it on a different router. But I think we covered most of the ones that are valid. It's just you have to be very, very tricky of locations. There's mm -hmm. another command called area filter list. The area filter list command is sort of similar. You can use it on an ABR. Um, it has the same functionality as the area range not advertise. I honestly think area filter list is a little easier for someone that doesn't know OSPF to understand because of the terminology. Like filter list, you know it's filtering. Area one range, it looks like a summary, and then you're tacking something onto the end to make it suppress the routes. But functionally, you'd put it at the same spot as a range. You can only use it at the same spot as a range. It's just a different command to, to do the same thing. 
Now, the syntax question, because I haven't uh, had to write such a filter for a long time. Can I use a prefix list in either a filter list or a distribute list? Can I call upon a prefix list? In a filter list, you can. So in, in can a I with a distribute list or not? I don't believe so. I believe distribute lists are only access lists. And I actually believe there's some yeah. restrictions on some platforms about what type of access list you need. Uh, yeah, that, okay. Well, that's that That was my memory, actually, that that was a thing. But I didn't know if in later versions of iOS, if that had maybe changed and, and gotten more permissive, what you could do with a distribute list. But I my history goes back far enough that there was a time in iOS before prefix lists, or they were you know pretty limited in what you could do with them. When that was a thing that I could write in iOS, I loved it. Prefix lists were so much more expressive. They were more flexible. They made more sense than trying to write um, access lists that would do the same kind of work. So for me, one of the attractions of using a filter list here to accomplish OSPF filtering is I can call a prefix list that, to my way of thinking and, and uh, looking at code, just is so much more readable, makes so much more sense. I agree. And I think that wildcard masks confuse a lot of people. And if you're using an access list, you're using a wildcard mask. Of course. And you may be doing the right thing on the OSPF side and not catching what you're expecting to catch because you made a mathematical error with the wildcard mask. And it's so much less prone to being that case if you're using a prefix list because it's it's CIDR notation. Can I just say that uh, wildcard masks are another interesting place you can do stupid router tricks? You can do some really <laughs> weird things with wildcard masks that cause some really unusual uh, effects. It can be super fun. So there's, uh, boy, if you get into like a Narpa Kacharian's CCIE class or his boot camp or something like that, he'll throw some stuff out at you once in a while. Well, if you do this, you know, non-contiguous, ma basically a non-contiguous mask, so you're filtering on you know all kinds of odd things. You can come up with some really interesting results that maybe aren't useful, but maybe are in certain scenarios. It's pretty interesting. Uh, but anyway, going back to prefix lists, yeah, right. Not wildcard masks. You're just using um, prefix length at the end, and you can use uh, slash notation um, or or effectively that. And uh, have ranges, and man, I just I fell in love with prefix list when that became a tool that uh, Cisco distributed widely uh, across the platforms. It's pretty great. Now, like you said, there, well, are, there is some stuff in prefix list you you can't do that you can do in access list. So there's still a use for distribute list. It's it's usually weird mathematical things, like you said. It's more of those trick questions. But yes. there are there are cases where an access list is unfortunately, in my opinion, needed to to do what you want to yeah. do. Well, what else do we need to say about OSPF route filtering that we haven't said, Mason? I think we covered most of it. I think if you're thinking about doing OSPF route filtering, there's there's probably a better way to accomplish your goal. If there's not a better way to accomplish your goal, you really need to understand the network that you're implementing the filtering on. Because if you don't understand the network that you're implementing the filtering on, it's really hard to know where to filter. A lot of people can give you the commands that you need to do the filtering, but unless you really know your network, you won't know where to put them. Hmm. Exactly right. That's a great summary. Have you come across cases where the other methods we discussed really weren't appropriate and you had to get into uh, OSPF route filtering to accomplish something? It's funny you say that. I actually, I haven't experienced that, but what I have experienced is people using a completely different protocol because of it. I've Just avoiding OSPF entirely? And unfortunately, in the case I'm thinking of, they used RIP. Uh, oh, boy. Okay. Yeah. So so they used RIP, was RIP <laughs> over an MPLS connection. Um, and my theory of why they did that is because they were doing some filtering on the, RIP, on the RIP process that wouldn't have been possible on OSPF. Well, and what this was your choice of Ben as a, you know, not RIP, but, but what? In that, in that instance, it was non-Cisco hardware. I would have chose BGP. I mean, yeah, that might be an yeah. unpopular opinion, but if, if they wanted that level of flexibility, they should have used BGP. And this was not an old install. This was put in in 2021. Mm. So the fact that someone defaulted to RIP because they were uncomfortable with another IGP or just using BGP, that's why I think we might see some of this out in the wild still for a while.
Well, Mason, your website is masonreimer.com. Uh, how else can people follow you on the internet? I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, I actually just released a workbook for Cisco Software Defined Access, and it's completely free. So there's a, a lot of resources that I'll share on there. Usually when I make a blog post, I share it out on LinkedIn. So that's where I would say you'd have the best bet finding me. Okay. Uh, are you active in any Slack groups by chance? I am in the free range routing Slack group. Um, yeah. I don't talk much, but I do consume a lot. I'm really <laughs> trying to get into open source routing. I think it's really cool. And, and then how far along are you in your CCIE study work? It's actually scheduled for August 27th. So Ooh, you've got I, the was, I was going okay. to take it at live. And by the time I worked up the courage to schedule it, all the seats were gone. So, so this is the full lab you're saying though, the eight hour lab or, or, or yes. the written wall exam? The, the, or, written yeah. one, the written one I've actually taken and passed twice. It was a funny story. So I took it and I waited too long to take the lab that even though I'd renewed it, renewing it doesn't count. You have to have it passed within the last three years. So I've taken and passed written twice now. Now I just have to take the lab, which is scheduled. Congrats, man. Uh, I'm sure you're anxious. <laughs> you. It's a tough thing. Yeah. Um, I know the pass rate for first time lab attempts is, uh, is low. Um, but, but man, you've got a lot going on in that brain of yours. So I, I wish you luck. I hope <laughs> you're you. one of the, one of the one hit wonders that uh, actually gets in that lab and nails it the first time. But if you don't, if you don't, don't lose hope. There's yeah, friends of mine who took, it took it seven times before they actually got through it. There are people that are, that are that stubborn, but, uh, but yeah, and uh, you know, any other advice I can say, having been through the process, is don't let them throw you, man. They're because they're going to try, but just you know, take a minute and think about it. And if you can't get it right, then just move on to some other task and come back, and it'll hit you. You're like, ah, I know what it is, and then then off you go. That actually happened to me over lunch. I got stuck on a specific problem right before lunch. And then there, yeah, at that time, I don't know how it is now, but it was a mandatory lunch break. And over lunch, my brain went, I know, I know what it is. I know what it is. And I'm glad I had that, however long it was, to think about it. Got back in after lunch, made one quick update, boop, 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 solved the problem. <laughs> Off and going, let's go, let's go, let's go. So just, they're going to try to get you. Don't let them get you. Don't let them get in your head, man. Don't let them get in your head. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. You got this thing. All right, everybody, that wraps up the show for today. Thank you for listening to Heavy Networking. In a world of overlays and automation, we do tend to lose sight of the fundamentals of networking, and no one seems to care as much about the underlay, even though it's the thing that the entire modern network infrastructure relies upon to be robust and stable and trouble-free. More fundamentals coming up in future episodes of Heavy Networking. The basics are never going to stop mattering. For more networking, security, cloud, strategy, and leadership content by and for IT engineers like you, visit PacketPushers.net. You're going to find our entire lineup of podcasts there, along with our newsletters, technical blog, YouTube channel, and community Slack group. If you have feedback for this episode, hit PacketPushers.net slash follow-up to ask questions or tell us about your own filtering techniques. I've been Ethan Banks, along with Drew Connery Murray. We hope you're having an amazing day, and we will see you on LinkedIn or Slack. Last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.